Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's McGill Alumni Webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. It has now been nearly four months since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus and COVID-19 to be a global pandemic. Since that time, more than 11 million people around the world have been knowingly infected by the virus, and more than half a million have died. Some countries, such as South Korea and Germany, have had tremendous success in flattening the curve of infections and hospitalizations and are now well on their way to reopening their economies and their societies. In other areas, particularly here in the Western Hemisphere, infections and fatalities continue to rise at alarming rates and reopening is proving to be more difficult. What have we learned about this coronavirus and how it spreads within our communities? What are the most effective ways to stop or greatly slow it down as the world waits for a vaccine? And what should governments and individuals be doing now to avoid an even more devastating second wave this fall? It's Thursday, July 9th. And in this week's McGill Alumni webcast, preparing for a second wave, are we up to the test? We sit down with four leading global health experts to explore these questions and try to understand what measures and strategies the scientific community is suggesting we implement ahead of a second wave of infections. Well, let's introduce our panel. Dr. Tim Evans is a familiar face to regular viewers of this webcast series. He is the inaugural director of McGill School of Population and Global Health, formerly the assistant director general at the World Health Organization, and since April, April has been heading up the Secretariat overseeing Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Welcome back, Dr. Evans. We have Dr. Dick Menzies, a professor in McGill's Faculty of Medicine and a physician and respiratory epidemiologist at the Montreal Chest Institute, as well as Associate Director of the WHO McGill Collaborating Center for TB Research. Welcome, Dr. Menzies. Dr. Shan Solin is Managing Director of Pharos Global Health Advisors a nonprofit strategy and policy advisory organization in Boston, as well as a lecturer at Yale's Jackson, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and a two-time McGill graduate with a BSc in microbiology and immunology and a PhD in experimental medicine. Welcome, Dr. Solin. And finally, Dr. Robert Hecht is a professor of clinical epidemiology at Yale University and president of Farrell's Global Health Advisors. He and his family are also strong supporters of McGill's Global Health Program with a focus on student internships and research projects. Welcome to all four of you. What a star-studded panel we have with us today. And if anyone is bound to solve the coronavirus puzzle within the next hour, it could be this quartet. Um, so before we jump into the conversation, a reminder that we did receive many great questions ahead of today's webcast, and we'll be sure to leave ample time at the end for the panel to address some of these. If you are watching live and have a question of your own, you can send it in by email to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll try to add it to the list. So let me put my first question to uh, you, Dr. Evans. Um, I think we can all appreciate that this coronavirus has presented the scientific community with many questions and challenges and lots of evolving information. So from your perspective, what are, the, what are the one or two most important things that we know about the virus today that we didn't know at the beginning of this outbreak? And how has that helped public health officials rethink how to protect societies and manage the crisis? Well, I, I think uh, perhaps the most important thing that we've learned is humility, uh, uh, that uh, this uh, virus keeps on uh, raising issues which uh, challenge any orthodoxy that somehow we know it's, uh, we understand it, or that we've seen this before, or it's exactly like flu. Uh, so I think we have to uh, have tremendous humility. But if I was going to be specific, I think the one area that has been so fundamental is the area of asymptomatic transmission. And this is the, the, the realization that many people who get infected and who are capable of transmitting infection because they are carrying the virus, they're shedding virus, uh, they are showing no symptoms or are feeling well. And because that's such a large number, uh, all of our testing systems that have been directed towards people with symptoms have missed this major part of the transmission. So I think uh, to me, it's this asymptomatic transmission that is probably uh, for me, the, uh, the, the most fundamental learning lesson at, because it has challenged the way we've been tracking the disease uh, and demands us to rethink uh, how to uh, track the disease if we're going to uh, recognize asymptomatic uh, transmission as a hallmark uh, of this infection. Mm 
Great. Well, thanks for that, that introduction. And I think it sets up this conversation very well. And I would like actually to move on to the issue of testing right now. Uh, that seems to be on everyone's mind these days and is one of the metrics that is measured and reported on an almost daily basis by many of our governments and public health agencies. Uh, Dr. Menzies, um, in a recent op-ed piece of yours, you said we have not seen any coherent testing strategy. You've also suggested that here in Canada, the government ought to test 9 million Canadians over three months at a projected cost of over $1 billion. So I guess my question to you is, are, is that realistic? And what should a coherent test, testing strategy look like if we are to emerge from this pandemic quickly? Uh, thanks, Derek. Um, so first, I, I think we said 9 million, not 90. Did I hear you say 90? Anyway. No, um, 9. I don't think we have 90 million Canadians. No, exactly. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, so in terms of a coherent strategy, what we've said is following on Tim's comment that it's the asymptomatic persons that are not being diagnosed now that are contributing enormously to the transmission. Um, we are, our feeling is that you need to test people who are asymptomatic, but how do you go about that? You can't just test willy nilly. Uh, it's probably not wise to just set up a booth on the corner of the street and test people going by. You need to think about who's at risk who's exposed, and is there some sort of priority that you can create? So for example, we know that contacts, especially close contacts, are at high risk of being infected. Estimates vary anywhere from 10% to 40%, depending on the study, of contacts are infected. Of those, probably the majority are asymptomatic, especially if you uh, go out and test early. Uh, the next group would be people who have a, lo a lot of exposure to patients who are themselves infected, which is, of course, healthcare workers. Very important group to be testing systematically and probably regularly. How regularly is another whole debate. And then the next group would be people who have a lot of public exposure. So your grocery store employees are possibly uh, getting infected. And if they're feeling well, they keep going to work, of course. So maybe not only they get infected, but they're, they're now transmitting back to the next group of, of uh, customers. So I think there's a hierarchy. You can work out who should be tested, highest priority, next priority, and, and so on. Uh, uh, we've also suggested that school children and people working in schools should be tested uh, when schools are reopened in the fall as a way to Again, stay safe. Do we need to test everybody? We we kind of presented the upper end of the of the bill, if you will. A billion dollars <laughs> seems like a lot, but I see in the uh, news that the federal government is running a deficit of three hundred and forty billion because of COVID. So I think one billion for testing to reopen the economy is probably a pretty reasonable investment compared to three hundred and forty billion that they're losing. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So, yeah, well, thank you for that for that answer. Uh, let me turn to you, Dr. Solin. I guess the question I, I would have is, how do we persuade people to get tested if they're feeling fine, displaying no symptoms of the virus? Are there strategies that governments you know, can think about putting in place to get more people tested? You know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, just uh, working a little bit off of what uh, Dr. Menzies was saying, you know, having these, these tiered priorities, um, identifying uh, groups of people who are both most at risk to themselves and also both most at risk for transmitting to others is is critically important. Um, certainly for, we, we would hope, at least we're trying to cheer you on in Canada, that you would do a better job of having a national testing strategy than we are likely to achieve here in the U.S. Um, my wish would be that either the federal or state governments would put together some kind of mandatory testing requirements for big employers. Once you have a lot of employ uh, employees at risk, including hotels, um, you know, meatpacking plants, um, Amazon warehouses, we have, to what Dr. Evans was saying earlier, although we have to be humble about all the things we don't know, there's a lot of things we do know. We already know what kind of workplaces um, are more dangerous than others, bars, for instance. Um, we expect university students as they come back. These are all high priority groups where we feel quite strongly that some government intervention to mandate um, testing is going to be critical since the risk to the general community um, is so high. Um, I'm going to maybe pause here and, and maybe Dr. Hecht can jump in. I don't mean to preempt you, Derek. 
Um, but he has other things that he wanted to say on this related topic. I didn't want to steal his thunder. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead on that. You know, I, well, another question I had, maybe that's what you're going to get, is, is why is the testing in the U.S. and Canada lagging behind uh, the levels that you feel are, are needed to, to maintain strong surveillance? Um, so I'll, I'll let you jump in on with your thoughts on that. Okay, thanks, uh, Derek. Uh, look, in general, in the U.S., uh, we ought to be testing one to two million people a day. Uh, right now, we're just at 600,000 a day. And uh, Dick is calling for scaled up testing in Canada, too. Uh, I guess the nine million over three months, uh, Dick, averages out to about 100,000 a day. So that seems to be where you'd, you'd like to see, see things going. Um, the way we've been looking at it, there are actually three different kinds of testing or three purposes for testing. One is surveillance testing, just to keep tabs on what's going on. The second one, of course, is testing those with symptoms so that uh, their status can be confirmed and they can be treated, watched, and so on. And then there's all this testing for these high risk but asymptomatic people and others. That's what our friends uh, Atul Gawande and Nikhil Bajwani uh, have called assurance testing in their recent article in the Harvard Business Review. And it's this third kind of testing that's going to absorb the lion's share of uh, all the tests in Canada and in the US. Um, and this testing of the high-risk asymptomatics that, uh, uh, that Tim pointed to, it's just hugely important. We argued this, Shan and I, back at the end of April in a, an opinion piece in the New York Times. Um, Tim and Dick could perhaps put their fingers on why testing in Canada is not as high as it should be. Um, but at least in Canada, you have a very well-coordinated federal and provincial policy framework, and you can use the provincial health insurance system to drive testing in a coherent way. Here in the U.S., things are really chaotic and fragmented um, because of the nature of our health system, which is also uh, fragmented, and by the lack of, of uh, overall federal leadership on COVID-19. Um, in, in the U.S., to come to your question, uh, Derek, we need to use... Uh, really a risk, uh, uh, sorry, a range of measures to try to improve both the supply and the demand side of testing. These days, I think uh, the demand side is more important than supply, except in a few places like Florida and Arizona where people can't get tests that they, that they need. Um, I'm hopeful that in most of the US, um, the demand for testing will rise in the next few months because employers and trade unions are gonna spur this increase. Um, and I think the universities in the U.S. that want to open in September will also uh, greatly boost the amount of, of testing. So uh, my, my view is that, uh, that uh, there are measures we can take that we're on the cusp of taking here in the U.S. to increase the, uh, the amount of testing being done, but it's going to be a tough slog in the next few months. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank, thanks for that. Um, I do want to, before we move on from, from the, the subject of testing, and I do want to get to some other issues, including the reopening of societies and schools, um, but I do want to ask you, Dr. Evans, um, about the antibody testing, uh, which is a separate kind of testing. So I know when you were last on the webcast at the end of April, you had just been named uh, one of the heads of Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Uh, so this is really not about testing people actively with the nose swabs, as we know, but more of a blood testing to determine if people might have antibodies in their system that would indicate that they had already previously been infected with the virus, uh, whether or not they showed symptoms. So can you tell us where we are uh, as a country here in Canada in that process? And, and do we have a sense yet about the accuracy of these antibody tests in terms of determining who might have already been infected and therefore be immune from a potential second wave? Yeah. Uh, great. Well, thanks, Derek, and, and thanks to Rob, Shan, and Dick for those great comments. Um, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 Immunity uh, Task Force, uh, we were created in April, uh, late April, and uh, there were no approved uh, uh, antibody tests at that time in Canada. Uh, so we've come a long way now. We've got four approved uh, antibody tests that are very accurate, very highly performing. Uh, and, and that's absolutely critical uh, because not all antibody tests are high performing. And we've seen, uh, uh, in fact, Dick Menzies and some colleagues uh, of his have uh, recently published a, a very important paper in the British Medical Journal, uh, which uh, describes some of the problems with the accuracy. So first and foremost, the task forces said 
make sure if we're doing these studies in Canada, we use accurate tests. And we have uh, a, a very good test now. The challenge is that these tests have to work with blood that's drawn from a vein. They're not good. Uh, we don't have good tests that can be used at home using a pinprick uh, or uh, uh, another method which would make it more accessible. So this is one of the areas where we're pushing hard to see if we can get um, cheaper, easier to use tests at home that meet the standards of accuracy. And so that's a, a big priority for the task force. In terms of what we're doing, uh, we decided to go where the blood is. And so we've been looking at the blood banks, um, uh, Canadian Blood Services in Hema Quebec, but also uh, women uh, donate blood um, uh, in our, 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 um, the blood of women who are pregnant is taken in the first trimester to screen for all sorts of diseases. So these are our, our sources of blood that can be tested and give us a sense of uh, what the background levels of infection are. And uh, then we're moving this to uh, more uh, well-designed platforms uh, that give us insights on the elderly or children, uh, in addition to um, uh, the, uh, the uh, insights we might get from the blood banks. But in general, the first principle of the, uh, of the task force is to get a sense of what that full picture of infection looks like. And what we've seen from studies elsewhere um, uh, is that uh, you can expect anywhere from eight to as much as 20 times more people being infected than are being detected using the nasal swabs. And, and so this gives you a sense of uh, the base of the iceberg, uh, the, the numbers of people who are infected and who are completely asymptomatic. Uh, it gives you a sense of the patterns of transmission. And it also gives you denominators, uh, which are important understanding uh, the infection fatality rate. And when we have those denominators, we realize that it's, uh, you know, the, the number of people who get this infection and die is somewhere around 1% uh, or less, as opposed to six or more percent when we look at the case fatality rate. So it gives you a bit of better perspective on that. So that's the first area. The second is we need to understand uh, what it means to show antibodies in the blood. Does this protect you for inf from infection uh, fully or partially? Uh, will you get reinfected or not? And how long will that protection last? These are real questions. And to do that, what we're doing is we're following out populations that have been infected and with antibodies and are showing antibodies and looking at over time uh, uh, what that antibody response looks like uh, and indeed whether or not it will be protective in terms of reinfection. So that's the second major area and those studies are, are just getting underway. Obviously they'll take a longer time before we have results, uh, uh, but uh, they'll give us a, a really important insights on, on what antibody response means, what's the nature of the immune response, uh, how strong it is protective and how long it will last. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Dr. Menzies, I, I was just noticing this morning in the New York Times, I glanced very quickly that they've started to do these antibody tests in New York and in some of the most hard hit neighborhoods like uh, I think Queens and, and the Bronx, they've noticed up to 60, 65 percent of the population uh, having these antibodies. So does that surprise you at all those numbers? And does that suggest that we are approaching what you know, the, the scientific community is referring to the herd immunity that we're kind of hoping to achieve? Um, yeah, I saw that as well. Uh, I, I'd say that it is certainly surprising. I had heard that some of the favela in Rio de Janeiro, they're looking at 25 to 30% serology positive, which I thought was already an astounding number. But to hear about 50 to 60% positive in some neighborhoods, which tend to be the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, uh, which again, perhaps reflects the, uh, you know, the difficulties of access to care, poor access to diagnosis, and uh, maybe also you know greater crowding and that sort of thing. Um, so these these uh, populations are obviously very at risk, and that's why perhaps we're seeing the excess of mortality because again that tip of the iceberg is the mortality that we're seeing in these same population groups that are poor mm -hmm. and disadvantaged. 
So on the other hand, apparently the richer neighborhoods, uh, much, much lower prevalence of antibodies. Um, again, I haven't seen the original article, so you'd want to know about the uh, test itself, what was used and whether there was good specificity, obviously, oh, no false positives. But I, I think it tells you that in some neighborhoods, yeah, you're, you're reaching those levels of herd immunity, but at really a terrible cost. That's the problem with herd immunity. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all very well to talk about it, but you know, Boris Johnson, I think, talked about herd immunity until he ended up in the ICU, and I don't hear him talking about herd immunity anymore. <laughs> so you know, that's right. you gotta you gotta really you know kind of take it seriously that herd immunity is at an enormous human cost. And uh, yes, it's great that so many people are asymptomatic, and it's great that it's only one percent fatality. But still, when you know 60% of the population is getting infected, it's a lot of deaths, and not all in you know 70-year-olds. Some are the 40-year-olds, and so on that we hear so much about. Mm -hmm. And then there's Great. also the long-term sequelae. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for that. I guess sobering reflection on on the news out of New York this morning. Yeah. Um, so let me turn uh, now to sort of this this notion of reopening our societies, which we sort of hinted at in some of the conversation around the testing. Um, Dr. Solin, in an op-ed piece that you and Dr. Heck uh, co-published in the Boston Globe in June, you said, and I'll, I'll quote you here, the shape of the second wave will be the direct product of our collective actions. So I'm wondering, what, what did you mean by that? And how should governments and individuals approach the reopening of society in a way that might prevent a second wave? Well, we, we wrote that sentence to try to encourage people to fully recognize and understand that um, everyone's, what, what everyone is doing is contributing to the case curves that we're seeing every day and that we're monitoring very closely. Um, it's everyone's individual actions about whether they maintain social distance, um, how well they wore their masks, um, how much they washed their hands, and just how really how much proximity they were keeping from other people. Um, this virus doesn't care about your political affiliations. It doesn't care about where you live. Um, it's just seeking other hosts, which is what all viruses do. And by continuing to congregate in churches, in uh, bars, in restaurants, in poorly ventilated places, um, and those are those are choices, and that's in contrast to what Dr. Menzies was saying. Some of these disadvantaged neighborhoods, you have highly dense people living together. They don't have choices. So I'm trying to separate choice and and not choice. But the what everyone is doing together, um, in aggregate, is what makes that disease curve. So, um, it should not be surprising to people that you know, there's, we're focusing a lot today and, and in the news on the second wave, we're, we're not out of the first wave yet. Um, I would say out of the, the US, um, we're doing better here in Massachusetts. Um, in Canada, I, I, I think you've, I mean, you've done a very nice job of flattening your curve and maybe you can make an argument that, that you had survived your first wave, but um, this is not a virus that has gone away. And I don't think it's one that uh, we're winning yet. I think, I still think the virus is in control or is at least has the potential to, to come roaring back. And um, the shape of that second curve, how bad it is, um, how many more lives it takes in all the other places in Canada and the US who have not achieved quasi herd immunity, even assuming that that's a real thing. And that came at a very heavy cost to Brooklyn, Queens, um, Chelsea here in Massachusetts. There's many places that we can name where they may, they may have achieved herd immunity, but at, at tremendous amounts of death and suffering and cost of the health system. Um, all of that, that avoidance is, is really gonna be dependent on how much we respect this virus um, and how much personal sacrifice and accountability that we're willing to take as a society to, to, to maintain distance whenever we can. Mm -hmm. Great. So Dr. Hecht, um, maybe to follow up on that, that point, I know we've seen reports of, of huge surges in infections in the last Last week or two in places like Florida, Texas, and, and Arizona, to name just a few. Uh, does this mean, in your opinion, that we are in fact moving too quickly as a society in terms of reopening? And what lessons can, can those of us to say here in Canada where things are better, uh, what lessons can we or should we take um, from what we're seeing south of the border? Well, thanks, Derek. Uh, yes, the answer is that these states like uh, Arizona and Texas and Florida and Mississippi uh, 
uh, have moved much too quickly and frankly recklessly over the last uh, six weeks. I don't think there's any question about it. And it's uh, very distressing uh, to see that. Uh, during the, the lockdown phase back in April, May, these states were never really very serious and compliant about the stay at home orders, the distancing, uh, the mask use, all these non-pharmaceutical measures. Um, and we know that mask use has been much lower in the, those parts of the country than, than say here in the Northeastern US, uh, the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. Um, and in many cases, the political leaders, the governors and the mayors were very cavalier about COVID, uh, dismissing it or doubting its seriousness uh, and, uh, and not uh, showing the kind of leadership that's, that's needed, not listening to their own public health uh, officials. Um, these states, just like every uh, state here in the US, establish certain goals and targets for moving into the reopening, the phased approach, which we've had here in the US, uh, more or less copying uh, Centers for Disease Control federal guidelines. Um, these have been uh, um, gate gateways or measures like uh, seeing hospital beds uh, empty out or reduce uh, the, the load, or bringing down the number of uh, tests that prove to be positive to under 5% or 2%. Um, but in these states like Florida and Arizona and, and, and Texas, when these, when these states just failed to, to meet their own targets, the targets they set for themselves, they just went ahead and moved to the next phase of reopening, going from outdoor dining to in, in indoor dining and so on and so forth before they were ready. Um, they just drove right through the red lights that were flashing because they didn't really care or they weren't uh, willing to accept the fact that they weren't green and, and they, were, they, they were on uh, cruise control, they weren't gonna stop. Um, and as a result, the, the community transmission in these, in these uh, states continued in the spring and never really abated that much. It was like a, an ember burning slowly in the underbrush. And then when they reopened, it's burst into flames and it's now just a huge fire, which they're, not, they're unable to contain. So what do they need to do? Uh, frankly, they're not going to uh, reverse things unless they roll back some of the reopening measures. That's going to be very hard politically and economically for them to do. But at least they could target those measures that are really fueling the fire the most. It's not everything they've done that's causing this resurgence. Reopening bars and nightclubs, uh, allowing people to congregate again, in, unfortunately, in houses of worship where they crowd together and they sing. Um, having them get together in densely packed crowds on the beaches and playgrounds um, and just maintaining very poor distancing and mass practice in dense workplaces like in meatpacking factories that we all hear about. Um, and, and we're really worried that uh, poorly planned and slop, sloppily implemented reopening of undergraduate universities. You talked about schools, I think K to 12, but we're very worried here in the US about the reopening of the undergraduate universities and colleges where it's gonna be very hard to test and to control the spread of COVID. So those are the areas really where uh, these states are gonna to need to step in if they're going to uh, target these high risk situations. Um, and then at least they'd have some chance, even a, a small chance of uh, uh, bringing these uh, outbreaks under control. So we'll see in the next few months if they have the courage politically and, and, and uh, from a public health point of view to act wisely, but the signs as of uh, today are just not very encouraging. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I, I feel like we can't have a proper discussion on this topic uh, at about sort of, you know, the role of public health and, and people's ability to, to follow guidelines without talking about face masks. Seems to be the topic du jour, at least this week here in Canada. Um, so maybe I'll turn back to you, Dr. Solin, on this. Um, I know that you were calling for universal use of face masks uh, back in a Boston Globe uh, article as early as mid-March. Uh, just this week here in Canada, we've seen some, some, some interesting developments. So the cities of Toronto and Ottawa have made face masks mandatory now in all indoor shops and public spaces. And the mayor of Montreal announced this week that her city will enact a similar law by the end of the month. Um, and yet, as Dr. Heck referenced earlier, the debate around face masks seems to become so politicized, um, especially where you are in the United States. Um, so I'm wondering, why do you think this is the case and what impact might this have on preventing a second wave? Well, thanks, Derek. Masks are my favorite topic as I'm not. <laughs> um, 
just going back a little bit, um, both Dr. Hecht and I felt very strongly um, in March that because we didn't have anything else, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a drug, um, all of these so-called um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, which include masking, social distancing, hand washing, et cetera, would be really critical because you have nothing else. Um, so I think here in the US, it's been, it's been complicated and troubled, I would say, to get people to accept mask use. Um, the CDC and the federal government did not help by at first saying masks don't work. Um, this was actually just untrue. Um, it was done because there was a fear that, that people, lay people would start to hoard medical masks, um, surgical ones and N95 masks that are so desperately needed by health workers um, that they, 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 they released information that was untrue. Um, and I think that reversal and this kind of clumsy reversal to say, well, actually we didn't know about asymptomatic transmission also not true, um, but masks can now help against that. Um, this kind of 180 and in an environment where where trust of experts is not as high as one would hope um, has done a lot to erode uh, public confidence in masks. Um, the other disappointing thing, at least here in the US is that as you said, masking has just become so politicized. It's not seen as a tool of prevention anymore. It's seen as a, a symbol of your affiliation to a, a particular political party. Um, it's, it's seen as an infringement on, on personal rights. And to me, I don't really understand A, why people feel they have the right to put others in danger. Um, and also why people feel like they don't have a responsibility to keep everyone safe. These are just things that I think on a human level um, are very confusing to me. And especially mm -hmm. when the, the request to put a mask on is, is to me very, very small. Um, Dr. Hecht and I have been wearing our masks since February. Um, <laughs> I, he, I'm not a runner anymore, but he, he, he'll run with his mask. I mean, you, if you just keep it on all the time, you get used to it. It's a very small inconvenience to keep people safe. And I would mm -hmm. say that masks are integral to flattening that second wave. Um, I thought masks were important in March. I didn't realize even myself how important they would be. There's been a lot more, um, I think pretty good evidence right now, more studies that are being done that can, that show really if everyone wore masks, if 80% of us wore masks, um, it would almost be as good as a vaccine from some simulations, but it requires again complete, um, near population compliance to do this. And I'm personally not, not confident that the US will, will do that. And I hope that there's better luck in Canada. You know, we're half the half the year we're in winter anyway. We're already covering our faces with scarves. So I think that it's a it's a small ask um, to make, and hopefully Canadians will be wiser and smarter and kinder to each other. And I would say that we're right. here in the U.S. and willing to make very small sacrifices. Great, uh, Dr. Menzies, you want to jump in on that? Well, I think one of the issues with the masks is that, indeed, it's you're actually protecting others. If you happen to have the asymptomatic infection, mm -hmm. wearing the mask is not protecting you from inhaling the bacteria, the virus. Sorry, it's actually protecting others, and that perhaps that fundamental understanding is not out there. Most people wear masks thinking I'm protecting myself, mm -hmm. and that's true. That it's not clear that works. On the other hand, wearing the mask, if you have the infection, that's where it has an impact, right? That's and true. Mm -hmm. I think, but here in the U.S., they don't care. <laughs> it's just more about... No, I, I know, but <laughs> I think even the basic understanding yeah. is, mm -hmm. is lost on people. And so when they hear it doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know, some people, experts may say, well, it doesn't work to wear it. It doesn't protect you from inhaling mm -hmm. the virus. That's actually true, right? Well, Especially now that we think it's... <laughs> there's been certain studies I think that have been relatively well done that if you have multi-layered masks, they can perform as well as surgical masks. And, and it's not ever, ever gonna be as good as an N95, but there is yeah. some barrier protection too against at least larger droplets. Yeah, so I, I think, I think sorry, works, go ahead. I was gonna say it works in, in both directions, predominantly in preventing things coming yeah. in, but it also does prevent you from, from also pushing things out. I, I think Dr. Evans wants to weigh in as well on that. Yeah, just that um, as somebody who's straddled both sides of the border um, due to um, uh, uh, failures in family planning of my parents, um, 
um, I, 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 I have some association with the American psyche. And, and uh, I do think um, that uh, what Dick is saying uh, is uh, making a, a really important thing, uh, which is that you're, you're actually protecting others in, in, insofar as you're um, uh, unconsciously or unaware, uh, as most asymptomatic people are, that they may be shedding virus. Um, but um, I, my, my suggestion would be in opening up is that uh, you promote an epidemic of masquerade balls um, in which uh, you popularize in some real way masks as being much more socially acceptable um, and, and try, uh, as opposed to uh, take a hardline view, which um, I think in some respects is provoking uh, that individualist uh, live free and die uh, type of mentality, which you see on the license plates in New Hampshire. Um, but I, the other thing I think though is really important that Dick is making as a point mm -hmm. is that every individual here in the epidemic is an agent of public health and your behavior matters. And, and so I think it's not simply the mask wearing, it's respecting social distancing where we've got good evidence now that you, you, you at least one meter or two, uh, your, your, your likelihood of, of getting uh, uh, infected goes down. Um, but also um, the most effective therapeutic or preventive we have is soap. Wash your hands, viruses dissipate and disappear when you use soap and soap is available everywhere. So some of these things, um, they seem obvious, but they do make a difference and they really deserve to be reinforced. Really, I think to go in line with what Rob and Sean have been suggesting, which is you can collectively manage in, an, in, a, in, a, in a much more proactive way, the risk moving into a second wave. If you really bring together this evidence, which has individuals taking responsibility, in addition to uh, ramping up testing systems so that we're, we're, we have our eyes open with respect to where the epidemic is, is, um, is moving. Okay, uh, I think Dr. Heck, you wanted to jump in. If you can make it quickly, because we do have a lot of alumni. I know we're, we're holding up the fantastic questions that I'm sure are coming in. I just wanted to reinforce what uh, Tim said. He does uh, read the American Psyche uh, extremely well. We were really pleased to see that uh, none other than Dick Cheney, not Dick Menzies, but Dick Cheney the other day uh, went on uh, in the media wearing a mask and uh, promoting real men wear masks. Um, that's the sort of thing mm -hmm. that uh, can potentially change things. Unfortunately, uh, even though our president's uh, advisors and cabinet members all wear masks, especially when they're off camera, um, their commander in chief does not. So we have a role model problem here in this country. Thanks. Well, well perhaps what they need is uh, the, to think about matching the MAGA hats, ball caps with MAGA masks, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, but well, let's move along away from masks uh, for now. But thank you all for your insight on that. Uh, let, let's turn in fact to some of the questions we got from our alumni, uh, both ahead of this broadcast as well as some of them are coming in right now. And if you do have any questions, I uh, will try to squeeze some in. It's at aoc at mcgill.ca. Um, let's uh, go back to this other hot topic that you referenced earlier, which is the reopening of schools this fall. We received lots of questions from people about schools. Um, I'll start with this one. It comes from Leah Lash. BA98, who wrote to us from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, she wants to know if it's safe to send young preschool age kids back to school in the fall. Even if it's true they're not contracting COVID, are they able to spread it within their households? She says her 74 year old mother lives with them and she's afraid that her son could act as a conduit for the disease. Um, Dr. Menzies, you want to jump in on that one? I see you yeah, nodding. I I, th thanks, Dirk. Thanks, uh, Leah. Um, I think it's a very serious concern. That's personally my concern when people here go there, send their kids back to school or daycare, or now I see them in summer camps is, yeah, the kids may have very mild disease, but the worry is that they bring it home and give it to their parents, grandparents, and so on. I think we don't, uh, again, I don't have good, clear indication of how contagious kids are uh, there's maybe a bit of data, they're maybe a bit less contagious, but I don't think we can be confident to say they're not contagious. Uh, 
So I would be very concerned of that exact scenario. The child is gets sick in the daycare, is totally asymptomatic or a minor, you know, sniffles, comes home and the grandmother ends up in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So we did get another question. I, I don't want to stick on masks, but but this one uh, touches on schools and masks. It came from Carol Heffernan. And she's asking uh, whether students should wear masks in their classes throughout the day and on their school buses. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Solon, maybe I'll let you jump in on that one with your mask expertise. Um, yes, I think they should. Um, but at the same time, you know, children, depending on their age, differ in how well they're able to keep masks on. So we know that mm -hmm. uh, children under two, for instance, are, are not recommended to wear masks and for various reasons. Um, Parents can do a lot by modeling good masking behavior themselves, explaining to children why it's important that they keep theirs on. Actually, uh, uh, maybe children are more pure than us adults, but there's been some behavioral change studies that have shown that if you explain to children it's to, it's to keep others safe, they like to keep it on better. Um, but I, I would say certainly for enclosed spaces like school buses and schools where um, it's gonna be very hard if not impossible for schools to maintain the social distance requirements. Um, I think masking indoors is, is gonna be very, very important. Mm -hmm. Great. And one more question that came in regarding schools, I'll, I'll maybe direct this one to you, Dr. Heck, because it does reference colleges and universities, which you talked about earlier. This one is from Karen Kalawi from Nova Scotia. So she's wondering about the plans to welcome international students uh, coming to study in Canada, and I suppose the same uh, logic would apply in the United States. Uh, she says she knows of one university in her province that is planning to bring in students in two-week waves so as to minimize the potential spread, and says it would be comforting to know that everyone crossing our borders has to quarantine before coming into contact with local kids. Um, so does this make sense? Uh, and will international students uh, be quarantining separately? And is this what might make the difference uh, in having a safe return to uh, university campuses this fall? Thanks, uh, Derek. Yes, I think that uh, having those uh, international students quarantine, especially if they're coming from south of the border, um, maybe that's implied in the question, um, is, is important. <laughs> they're coming from uh, Korea or from China, uh, their risk uh, profile is gonna be lower, but it probably makes sense for both public health and equity reasons to have them all uh, quarantine. Uh, and uh, that's going to be extremely important to avoid imported uh, cases of COVID uh, in Canada in those university settings. That having been said, whether students are coming from nearby, just uh, coming to McGill from the suburbs of, uh, Montre of Montreal or coming from overseas, uh, making sure that when they are in residence, if they're gonna be in residence, I don't know what the policy is at McGill, I'll defer to, to Tim and others on that and to Dick, but I know at my university at Yale, the uh, undergraduates are being selectively welcomed back in a selective pattern to de-densify the dorms. Uh, but those students have to be repeatedly tested, they have to uh, wear masks, uh, classrooms are gonna be uh, very much uh, change for teaching purposes to spread kids out and if they have to attend large uh, lecture format with uh, hundreds of students those uh, courses are going to be delivered online it's going to be a very complex uh, hybrid situation at yale to make sure that uh, once those students are back whether they're coming from nearby in connecticut or coming from another part of the u.s or from overseas uh, that uh, that there isn't an outbreak of COVID. it can not only spread within the school community to elderly faculty and, and workers and so on. But a lot of these universities are in urban settings uh, and students come into contact with uh, others in the larger urban community. This uh, represents a huge threat to those larger communities. This is something that we, Shan and I have been arguing about for the last couple of months and, and uh, calling for universities to do the right thing, but also to think about the larger environment they're embedded in. Again, they're not operating in isolation. They're part of larger cities and uh, provinces and states, and they need to uh, do things that are consistent with the collective benefit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Menzies, you wanted to jump in on that point? Yeah, again, I, 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 I mean, I, I was glad to hear uh, Robert mention testing, but again, I, you know, maybe I'm a little obsessed with testing. I agree that masks are a, one of the strategy, hand washing, soap, et cetera, mm -hmm. but testing is also a technology that we have 
And while we still don't have a vaccine and we don't have effective treatment, I think we are still underemphasizing the utility of testing. Um, it's benign. Uh, we've looked at saliva testing versus, you know, these nasopharyngeal swabs. And for children, I think it's, you know, something to consider. Um, but repeated, you know, at least one-off testing when people start school, uh, come back to school, your international students, maybe twice, you know, there's all debate about how often you need to test. But testing these groups of students um, and, of course, someone to analyze the data and say there is a problem or we don't, we, there isn't a problem. We don't really need to do this again, but at least do it once so we know what we're dealing with. All right, Ed, Derek, Dr. Dr. Evans, just yeah. to follow up on, on Richard's good point, um, which is um, I think um, there's opportunities to lower risk considerably based on what we know, testing is part of it. But I think uh, we have to recognize that there will be cases. And the fact that there are cases does not mean that we have an epidemic. A case represents an outbreak. And outbreaks in many respects in the current setting are inevitable. What's unacceptable is letting an outbreak become an epidemic because we have the ability through testing and contact tracing and isolation and other measures to make sure we get on top of that case so that outbreak does not become an epidemic. And I think right. it's very important to use all our measures in such a way uh, that uh, we don't say that, oh, because there's one case on the McGill campus, uh, the whole university has to shut. No. Uh, we want to make sure that we're ready to deal with a case, we're expecting it, uh, and we have every measure in place to make sure we're contact tracing and decreasing as much as possible the likelihood that that one case can become the match that leads to a massive uh, epidemic. And so I think right. that mentality is important. One case, a couple of cases is not failure. Uh, failure is not responding appropriately with the knowledge that we have to make sure those that one or a couple of cases uh, 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 don't become uh, an epidemic. Great, thank you. So we, we only have a few minutes left. I'll try to get to as many of these other questions as I can. So maybe I'll ask our panelists to maybe give some, some short answers to these. I'll stick with you, Dr. Evans, don't go too far. There's a great question that came in from John Childs. He's asking how accurate are the COVID-19 numbers in Canada and in the rest of the world, when we read how some governments do extensive testing while others do not? Yeah. Well, I think um, uh, there's great variability uh, in the testing. And as, as uh, uh, Dr. Menzies said earlier in the call, um, unfortunately, uh, there's been an absence of coherent strategy to testing uh, within and across countries. And therefore, if you look at Canada's strategy or Canada's approach to testing, up until uh, mid to late March, uh, we were simply uh, testing people with uh, foreign, uh, recent foreign travel and symptoms. Uh, and it's only recently that we've started to see some major changes uh, in testing, which would recognize asymptomatic cases. So. Uh, I think uh, because of that variability, one has to look at the data and look at the numbers tested. Uh, but there are some data that help compare, and it's the tests positive per million, the number of tests per million. Uh, these rates give you a sense of um, the, the levels of testing in countries uh, and also the percent positive. And, and so those types of measures, which you can get on most of the worldometers and other things, um, are helpful in, uh, in identifying uh, reasonably reliable trends. So despite the absence, uh, there are ways in which we can make some sense of that data. Uh, but I wanna go back to what uh, Dick said earlier, uh, we really need to invest in more coherent strategies for testing in order to get on top of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Great. So Dr. Menzies, I'll turn the next question over to you. Uh, it sort of ties into that. This one just came into us uh, from Margaret Rudolph. And um, hold on, I had it right here. Um, she wants to know whether the cost of testing is a deterrent 
for some governments. And if you can comment on how the US and Canada are approaching the issue of costs. So that's a great question because the RT-PCR technology is uh, fairly costly. Although when we've looked at it, it turns out it's really gathering the samples, getting the samples to the lab, the, P, the protective equipment that actually account for maybe 80% of total costs. Uh, so 20% is the test and 80% is everything else. Um, and there are a lot of ways you can drive down that cost, especially if you're doing planned systematic testing, you can really push the cost per test down. So that $1 billion we estimate is a really upper end of the range. And we've looked at kind of fairly simple solutions that would drive that cost down to less than half if you are doing it with a bit more organization and planning. Mm -hmm. And then there are, you know, made for Canada, made in Canada, PCR mm -hmm. tests that are spearheaded by someone else, another group at McGill. I just want to plug that for a moment. Um, <laughs> you know, so a group of researchers started in March saying, oh my God, there's no PCR available in Canada, which was a huge problem and was part of the problem at the beginning for sure. Um, and they're now at a point where they've produced high quality, accurate RT-PCR tests for, they're not allowing me to say, but it's less cost. Um, hmm. And they can produce millions of tests with a, you know, a bit of government support. So it can be done. Uh, and I think costs can dramatically go down uh, with, a, with greater volume. And frankly, uh, again, as Dr. Evans keeps saying, a coherent government strategy. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, let me turn this next one over to you, Dr. Solan. This one came in as well in the last couple of minutes from Tony Rupchinski. Interesting question. He wants to know what parameters define a second wave versus just a continuation of the first wave? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I guess it's the shape. It's like how, <laughs> <laughs> how much, I'll take Massachusetts as an example. I mean, we, peaked very high. We were having, I guess, over 3,000 cases identified at our peak. Um, but back to what Dr. Evans was saying with 20 or 30% positivity rates coming back. And now we are at uh, less than 200 cases uh, statewide. And just for parameters, we are a state of 7 million people. So maybe about the size of Quebec, about the size of Ontario a little bit, roughly. Um, and our prevalence rates for testing, we're still testing between eight and 10,000 people per day, and the tests are coming back around one or 2%. So that tells you that you're testing broadly, you're not finding very many cases, and it's, you know, 98% lower than it was at its, at its high point. Um, I watch the dashboard every day with bated breath, because between 4th of July, between, uh, this, we're in phase three now of reopening. They just reopen indoor dining, uh, gyms. I, I don't know how we can keep it at this level um, mm -hmm. much longer, personally. But I'm, I'm trying to be an optimist about this. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's how you would know. You need to suppress the first wave low enough that you could see if it was starting to come back. You want to keep it as low as possible. Right, Not right. percent test positivity or less. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we might have time for maybe one or two more questions. This one came in earlier from David Winch. Um, he's actually questioning concerns around the second wave. It was a long email, so I'll do my best to paraphrase it. Uh, but he's a big supporter of Sweden's lighter lockdown model and says he sees no strong epidemi epidemiological reason for a second wave. He says that the most similar pandemic to ours today was the 1957-58 Asian flu pandemic which started in China and killed 116,000 Americans and perhaps 150,000 in Europe. And note that there was no second wave in 1959 or 1960. Why should COVID be different? Anyone want to jump in on that one? <laughs> I'm guessing that they had herd immunity, that the case fatality rate was a lot less with that flu. That would be my supposition. Whereas here we know from serology studies that you know, a lot, a lot smaller proportion of the population have been infected with COVID in most places in the world. So in mm -hmm. BC, Quebec, et cetera, it's a very small fraction that have been infected. Okay, yeah. Dr. Solin. I would also add that it's not the same as flu for many reasons, but because um, this is a brand new virus to us, everyone in in the world is naive to it. Um, the flu, although there's there's some bad ones, and that one was a bad one 
there's still some partial immunity that exists among the population as well that that blunts it. So um, I don't think that comparisons between COVID-19 and, and flu are, are appropriate. And also Sweden, I don't think is a good example, but we can discuss that another time. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Doctor, I see a lot of hands up. Dr. Evans, if you could mm -hmm. keep it short. Well, again, I, I think it goes back to humility. I, I, I think we really don't know. We were concerned about a second wave with SARS um, and we never saw it. And that was a coronavirus. Uh, coronavirus is different from flu, even though we've made lots of comparisons. Uh, the mortality profile from Spanish flu, very, very different from the mortality profile we're seeing from, uh, from this novel coronavirus. Uh, so I think the, uh, the basic answer is we don't know, uh, but I think more, more fundamentally, I don't think we can afford not to be prepared. And, and, and I think in the absence of that knowledge with the, as Dick said, we know that there are many, many susceptibles in, in many places, especially in Canada, where we, you know, the consequence of doing a good job on the first wave is we have lots of, lots of folks, um, uh, the majority of the population who have not been exposed. And so if we have another wave, uh, as we've seen the resurgence in, in the Southern United States, that travels barrels up the Mississippi and into our prairie provinces, uh, there's lots of susceptibles there, uh, which would uh, uh, lead to, in my view, um, uh, an opportunity for spread unless we're incredibly well prepared. So I think mm -hmm. we have to be prepared for a second wave, whether it comes or not. It doesn't. I saw, <laughs> yeah, I saw your hand up, Dr. I had one more question for you, but if you want to jump in on this one. Okay, well, it may be related to your question. I don't know. I was just going to tie this in a little bit with the search for a vaccine. Yes. Uh, I suspect that's on the minds of a lot of people. And we're all watching uh, the many darts that are being thrown at the dartboard right now. A lot of uh, US and uh, European and Canadian and other financing going into both the upfront uh, development in the labs of these uh, vaccine candidates and then lots of, of uh, price and volume guarantees to buy uh, an efficacious vaccine. I think there have been stories about the U.S. government putting billions of dollars into vaccines. I just want to point out that's mostly in the form of contingent willingness to buy the vaccine if it proves to be efficacious. That money's not going out the door to these unproven vaccines and vaccine companies uh, right away. But uh, I don't think any of us expects uh, a, a vaccine to be working and to be available in large quantity before uh, next year. And, and uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. So I think it only reinforces what everybody's saying about being prepared for the second wave. Uh, we're not gonna have a vaccine in time. I don't think we should certainly hold out hope that that's gonna solve all our problems. Great, Great. well, uh, Dr. Heck, thank you. And you did suspect correctly, my last question to you was gonna be about the vaccines and a question specific to uh, an article that appeared a couple of days ago in the New York Times about the US government committing uh, billions of dollars to a company to develop a vaccine that doesn't quite exist yet, but I think you've answered that well. Um, so listen, we're, we're just about at the top of the hour and that does wrap up the time we have today. I would have loved to have gone some additional thoughts from all of you. There's been an incredibly exciting and fascinating conversation, um, but we are sadly out of time. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind everyone that this video will be available at this very same link soon after a recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. And of course, uh, a big thank you to our incredibly knowledgeable panelists, Tim Evans and Dick Menzies from McGill's Faculty of Medicine, and Robert Hecht and Shan Solin from Global Health Advisors and Yale University for taking time out of what I know are your extremely busy schedules to come on with us today and share such important and valuable insight. Uh, before we close, I would like to take a moment to pay special tribute to a dear McGill friend and supporter who passed away on June 27th, and that is Cappy Flanders. Not only was Cappy an advocate and champion of so many programs here at McGill, including being the driving force behind the McGill Council on Palliative Care, the Canadian Palliative Care Initiative, and the popular series of mini McGill mini courses for lifelong learners, uh, but she was also a big supporter of all of our efforts to expand McGill expertise to the community, including this series of alumni webcasts. In fact, when we began this series in March, Cappy was often the very first person to email me as soon as we went off the air, providing high praise and sometimes constructive feedback on everything from the quality of the conversation, the knowledge of our guests, and even the contents of the bookcase behind me. Uh, Cappy will sorely be missed across the McGill community, 
but her contributions will long be remembered by the many people she helped, supported, and befriended during her incredible life. And so on behalf of all of us at McGill, we dedicate today's webcast to her memory. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back in two weeks' time on Thursday, July 23rd. Until then, please stay safe and be well. Thanks very much, Derek.